just showed you. Uh, in his PhD thesis, he suggested that both the alpha and the beta subunits must be interacting with the DNA, that uh, the alpha subunit must have one domain that interacts directly with the DNA, and then another domain which is making very strong interactions with the beta subunit in order to hold uh, the, in order to recruit beta subunit into the complex. And then that other portion of the beta chain, which I didn't tell you before, is very positively charged, contains very positively charged uh, or basic amino acids, is sticking out uh, as an arm to interact with other chromosomal ends. So this was the amount of detail we could get from our biochemical studies. And now growing crystals of this complex, the Schultz lab has been able to see what it really looks like. And of course, the reason I show you this picture is that it really looks fairly similar to what we were able to infer from the more indirect biochemical studies. The alpha subunit is the whitish uh, portion uh, on the top and the green portion, and you can see that there are two separate domains. The whitish portion interacts with the DNA. Let me take you through the DNA. In this particular crystal complex, there's a 12-nucleotide uh, artificial telomere. The first four guanine residues are shown in blue. The next four residues are the T's, and they're shown in yellow. And then the last four are G's again, and they're shown in um, as, as red units, and I think you can see them there, 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 and there. The uh, beta subunit also interacts with this telomeric DNA. So you can see the DNA is uh, coming down sort of in a cleft between the alpha and the beta subunits, making contacts with both polypeptides, and that the other domain of the alpha subunit doesn't directly interact with the DNA, but helps, make, but helps bring the beta subunit into the complex by having a very large surface of interaction and, uh, with, the, with the beta subunit to stabilize it entering into the complex. The alpha subunit alone binds pretty tightly to DNA, moderately tightly. It dissociates on the level, on, on the order of uh, once every minute or so, and then of course it can rebind. Once beta is recruited into the complex, the complex is stable for days. It is, according to the literature search we've done, it's the tightest, strongest nucleic acid protein complex we've been able to find uh, evidence for. And so the presence of beta ch converts this from a moderately stable uh, association to a rock that is very hard to, to pry off, leading to the interesting question, uh, when you copy the chromosome, maybe you have to dislodge this complex. There must be machinery there to interrupt this association between the protein and the nucleic acid. Now, let's move from the question of the capping off of the chromosome end. So, so far, I, RNA hasn't come into this picture at all. I hope you realize, finally, he isn't talking about RNA. It's just very simple DNA protein. But hold on, hold on to your seats, you're going to uh, see RNA in a minute here. So we now have to talk about the replication or the copying of the uh, chromosome. And the interior parts of the chromosome in higher organisms are copied in a way uh, rather similar to that first worked out by Arthur Kornberg and others for uh, replication of bacterial chromosomes. The DNA, the, our, the DNA chain has a polarity. It has a five prime end and a, and a three prime end. So there's a directionality to this string of nucleotides. And the D enzyme DNA polymerase only goes in one direction on the DNA. So it has a polarity too. It goes in the uh, opposite direction of the DNA chain. So if the DNA chain, the top one is shown going from three prime to five prime, so the DNA polymerase goes five prime to three prime, and can, in this direction, can continuously make a copy of the double helix out to the very end. Same thing here, in this continuous or leading strand direction, you can copy all the way out to the end. But then, 
in this position, because it can only uh, go in that one direction, before this bubble has been opened up all the way, it, there's only a little part available to be copied. So it makes a small discontinuous fragment, starting with an RNA primer. So there's a little piece of RNA that is put down on the DNA as a starting point, and then the DNA polymerase extends that. And it makes this extension, another one, another one, in each case then removing the little piece of RNA that started it out and filling in with DNA. And that can proceed all the way out to the end. Now, the dilemma about DNA replication at the end is that at the left end, so I'm only showing the daughter molecule that would be produced by the top strand. The um, copy of the top strand uh, would not have a problem at the very end because this uh, blue RNA primer can be removed and now you're back to having the three prime end of the chromosome hanging out which is the natural state. So that is complete replication then. The problem perhaps occurs instead at the other end of the chromosome, where complete replication will leave you with a uh, blunt end to the chromosome, no three prime overhang. And you can take my word for it, or you can draw it out for yourself, that the problem is exactly identical on the bottom strand. If you simply flip it around, you see that, again, at one end, the end where discontinuous replication takes place, you can uh, copy the end faithfully. At the other end, you lose some material. And scientists have seen this chromosome loss. If there's a defect in the machinery that overcomes this problem, the chromosome actually shrinks from its end. And as it shrinks, eventually you'll get into a place where there are important genes which are being lost. And so it's to prevent this sort of chromosome shrinkage that some special machinery is required. The machinery was discovered by Elizabeth Blackburn and her graduate student Carol Greider working at the University of California at Berkeley. And they found that the uh, machine responsible for solving this end replication problem was an unusual enzyme composed of both protein components, you can see this yellow and orange segment, but also an RNA molecule shown in purple. So this is a ribonucleoprotein enzyme that contains essential RNA and essential protein components. What do they each provide? Well, we know something of what they provide. The RNA strand has a region on it that is the complement of the sequence that has to be laid out at the end of the chromosome. So here's the chromosomal DNA. Here's its single strand extension. Uh, building blocks are being added and polymerized onto the end. How does it know that it's supposed to have the sequence T, T, G, 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 well, because the RNA template has the complementary sequence, and wherever there's an A in the template, a T is put down. Wherever there's a C in the template, a G is put down after it. If this were the human telomerase, the telomerase has been uh, isolated over the, the past year, and it's found, remember the telomere sequence differs in one out of the four positions. There's an A here, and so across from that A on the RNA strand, there's a U then, and otherwise the template sequence is very similar to, to what I've shown here. This is the, the tetrahymena version here. So the RNA provides a template and may provide other functions as well. The protein uh, presumably provides the catalytic machinery for bringing in the nucleotides and polymerizing them. So this is not a ribozyme. The RNA isn't able to do this by themselves. There's this uh, close cooperation between RNA and, and protein components. So how does this telomerase uh, solve this end replication problem? Well, in a word, Remember, the problem was down here that we have a blunt end chromosome. If telomerase can now simply extend this back out uh, to give this 